Hello and welcome to Global Pulpit, where the world is our parish. My name is Camille Matchley, Director of Teach All Nations, our tagline, Empowered Through Word and Spirit. Our goal is to give you God's unchanging word for changing times. Thank you for your company. We're in a mini-series called Walk Through the Word, Part 4. But before I give you the title, let me give you a quick little illustration. A few years ago, I was leading a group of Australian Christian pilgrims through the Holy Land. They came from different churches, different cities, indeed, even different states. So they weren't just one homogenous group, except they were all Christians and they were all Australians, and of different ethnicities as well. Nevertheless, I had a local guide who endeavored to be interactive by going to biblical sites and either asking what happened in the Bible at this particular site or what was the reference to the event or the site. And most of the time, these people couldn't answer the question. And these were fundamental, basic things, like, where was Jesus born? He then commented aloud, you don't seem to know your Bibles very well, do you? Now, he himself was not a Christian believer, but this was his verdict, if not indictment, on these lovely people. What does it all mean? As we endeavor to walk through the Word, what we're looking at is nothing less than a famine. But we won't call it that, but the Bible will. We'll look at the problem, but then, as always, we're going to look at the solution. Praise God. Let me read to you from Amos chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, and Matthew 22, verse 29. Amos chapter 8, it tells us this. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro and seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. With that, Matthew chapter 22, verses 29, and we'll leave it just there. This is Jesus speaking to the Sadducees who asked him a ridiculous question of an even more ludicrous example of one woman marrying seven brothers, all married them married the woman, not simultaneously, of course. None of them had children, so whose wife will she be in the resurrection? What was Jesus' response? First thing he said, you do err, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. In other words, we are in error, not just in theology, but even in life, when we don't know the scriptures or the power of God. That's what Jesus is saying. So instead of calling it a famine, why don't we use a more modern term? And we'll call it biblical illiteracy. In other words, not knowing what the Bible says. I want to thank Michael Vlosh for his article, Crisis in America, or America's Churches, and it's not just American churches. Bible knowledge is at an all-time low. And there's some quotes, like from George Barna, the Christian body in America is immersed in a crisis of biblical illiteracy. And then George Lindbeck, a Yale theologian, when I first arrived at Yale, even those who came from non-religious backgrounds knew the Bible better than most of those who now come from church-going families. By the way, during the time of Queen Victoria and the rise of Charles Darwin, even unreligious, downright atheistic people were knowledgeable about the Bible. Of course, that was in the mid-19th century. How times have changed. David Wells, author of No Place for Truth, I have watched with growing disbelief as the evangelical church has cheerfully plunged into astounding theological illiteracy. And then, of course, when you ask people 
to quote the Bible, two quotes come to mind. Cleanliness is next to godliness, and the most quoted Bible verse is God helps those who help themselves. What's amazing is neither of those quotes is in the Bible. Listen to these other statistics. Apparently, only 1% of adults embrace the 13 basic biblical teachings, and less than one out of every 10 believers has a biblical worldview. That is a scandal. In fact, I'd go as far as to say it's a state of emergency. You see, even with denominations like the Assemblies of God, which officially have a very orthodox, small o, high regard for scripture, 77% in the AOG say the Bible is accurate, 70% said Christ was sinless, 64% say that good works don't earn you a place in heaven. But think about it. If 64% say good works don't get you to heaven, what about the other 36%? Are they saying they do? And if 77% say the Bible is accurate, what about the 23%? Are they saying the Bible is inaccurate? This is coming from a group that has basically a strong view of Scripture and of sound doctrine. So what are we to make of this biblical illiteracy? It's, of course, neglected in the church and the pulpit, but also from our personal lives. Serious reading, in general, is declining. So if serious reading is declining, then that would also translate to serious reading of God's Word. And you know, in an age where we talk about fake news, I wish it was only limited to the news. We also live in an age of increasing deception, gaslighting, doublespeak, smoke and mirrors, half-truths, spin. And friends, you need the Word of God as your protection. Because as Jesus says in John 17, 17, sanctify them by the truth. Thy word is truth. And so, what else? Bible-based, Christ-centered, Spirit-anointed, God-honoring sermons have been replaced in our postmodern milieu with therapeutic feel-good. I remember one very prominent churchman. I respect this man, but I don't agree with what he said. Don't talk about sin. I never talk about it, neither shall you. And this is, person has a massive church. I just want people to feel good. Now, by the way, this churchman is not an American. I won't tell you who he is. I won't tell you where he is. But this therapeutic feel-good attitude is rife throughout the Western and or the Westernized churches. You see, if you don't teach sound doctrine, then what are you building your Christian life on? And where does sound doctrine come from? It comes from the Word of the Lord. You see, when people have a non-Christian worldview, and apparently most Christians are in that category, you will think like the world, you will feel like the world, you will speak like the world, you will act like the world. That's why some of the very potent, powerful ideologies like existentialism, postmodernism, cultural Marxism. Now, you think they're all on the outer? They have successfully infiltrated the church. And even we have what is called woke churches. I know that term is being used a lot. Many of you don't fully understand it. Can I just say, you don't want to be woke. What you do need is you want to be awakened. We all do. Awakened to the things of God, the Word, the Holy Spirit, the prophetic, and things to come. And so, as it says here, the average born-again baptized church-going person may have embraced elements of Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, that's rabbinic Judaism, Islam, Mormonism, Scientology, Unitarianism, even Christian science, without realizing 
that they just have their own synchronized faith. So remember what Jesus said to the Sadducees. Again, I repeat, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. What is the problem of being in error? It's like saying, what's the problem of intending to drive from Los Angeles to New York or from London to Edinburgh or from Paris to Vienna and you have the wrong map and you head in the wrong direction? Is that a problem? Of course it's a problem. But at least you can correct your journey if you're alert and alive. But if you don't correct your journey, you're going to end up in the wrong place. Remember that tragedy of the Malaysian Airlines flight that was to go from Kuala Lumpur to Beijing? And yet, for reasons we will never know, the plane didn't go towards Beijing, which is north of Kuala Lumpur. It went south to the Indian Ocean. And we still haven't found that wreckage till now. What do we do about it? The church needs to come back to the Word of God, because the Word of God is a lamp to our feet. It is a light to our path. When you have the Word of God, not just in your head, but hidden in your heart, it will keep you from sinning against God. If we're going to walk through the Word, we need to see there is a state of emergency with biblical illiteracy. It's like Pentecostals who don't have the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is a highly, highly emphasized doctrine. Or it would be like Baptists who have not been baptized in water by full immersion. If you had 40, 50 percent of your congregation not baptized in water as a Baptist or baptized in the Holy Spirit as a Pentecostal, then what do you do? Fill up that baptistry. Have an altar call. Welcome the Holy Spirit. You see, we don't want to lose the fear of the Lord, and the fear of the Lord does come from the Word. One of the things we seem to forget, there is a God in heaven. He is watching. He not only knows what we do outwardly, He also focuses on the heart. And so He sees things even we don't see about ourselves. And there will come a time, according to Romans 14, verse 12, that it says, Now every man shall give account of himself to God. To give an account is, of course, accountability. What is accountability? Accountability means to answer with your mouth for the actions of your life. Now, rebellious, sinful people don't like accountability. They want to do what they want to do, answer to no one, and if they need to be under the cloak of darkness, so be it. But can I just say, for people who value truth, honesty, character, integrity, you want accountability with man and with God. I often say accountability is an insurance policy for your integrity. Think about it. If you knew you had to answer to God for every idle thought, every idle word, and Jesus says in Matthew 12, that's going to be the case, or every idle action, that would help foster the fear of the Lord. And I believe you'd clean up your act quick smart. It's like the parable of the three teenage children. One I love to tell. It's my parable, by the way when introducing the subject of end-time prophecy last days. The three teenage children have their parents going away for a week, and the formidable mother says, I expect this house to be spick and span when I return, or else. The three teenage children say, yes, mom, it'll be fine. The parents go away. No sooner do they drive out from the driveway, those teenagers are on the phone inviting their friends for the party has begun. And so the friends come in and like a swarm of locusts, they clean out the pantry of all food, they turn the house upside down, the music's blaring, the television's blaring, everything is chaotic, it is pure bedlam. After the third day, the phone rings. 
It's the mother. I have an announcement, children. We're coming back early. Indeed, we're coming back today. What do you think goes on in the mind of those three teenage children? Simple. It's called repentance and revival. They get the kids, their friends, out of the house. They get 20 bottles of spray and wipe. The vacuum cleaner doesn't stop. They restock the cupboards. And when the parents drive into the driveway, the house is immaculate. Everyone will have to give account of themselves to God. Be glad you know this now, not at the end of days. Bible-based civilization in the West is what has given us our human rights, our parliamentary or congressional democracy, our freedoms, and the decaying of our biblical foundations, also called Judeo-Christian ethics, is causing untold damage to society. Now, Deuteronomy 17 speaks of the king having the book of the law so that they will obey it, and a failure to obey brings judgment. So what is the solution for this crisis in biblical illiteracy? illiteracy? Church leaders need to be informed of the crisis. Find out what the people know or what they don't know and remedy it. Now there's one church, and again, I won't name it even though it is public record. They did a survey just in time. It's a larger church of where their people are at, and they discovered to their horror that many of their key people were unhappy, justifiably unhappy, with their church because they weren't being fed the word of the Lord. Just the feel-good messages. So the church apparently took strong action, and they offered the possibility of Bible study, in-depth Bible study at church, whether it's verse-by-verse -verse commentary or topical, but they offered it. And I believe they averted disaster. We need to know what our people know. And then we need to return to teaching in the church, whether it's Sunday school, adult Bible study, or sometime during the week, small group Bible study that is intimate and interactive. According to the late Chuck Missler, there's no better way to grow as a Christian than in a small group, interactive, intimate home Bible study or Bible study somewhere. I believe that is correct. And he also went on to say, Missler, that it's better topical than textual. Actually, it's the other way around. It's the textual, verse by verse, that will be more an incentive for growth than even topical. And topical is good, whether it's on salvation, end times, Holy Spirit, or what have you. But we also need to teach our people, in addition to offering solid and inspiring and anointed content of God's Word in the church, is to teach our people how to feed themselves. Remember the adage, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach him to fish and he will be fed for a lifetime. Well, we need to teach people the same. Developing personal devotional habits, which are so essential to growing in God. There's one thing to read the Bible devotionally. It's another thing to study it. That's where the home Bible study with others helps because we're teaching people how to study the Word together, which means that in due course they will know how to study the Word for themselves. That's how I learned, and that's how we all learn. Because God's Word is a lamp to our feet, it is a light to our path. Friends, we want to offer the Word of God in this program of Global Pulpit and like-minded programs across the world. And we also offer verse-by-verse -verse commentary on key books of the Bible. I'm not saying this as a personal promotion. I'm saying this as a service. But I do challenge you. If we're going to avert disaster, if this church is going to be salt and light to this generation, we need to come back to Bethel, come back to the Holy Spirit, come back to the Lordship of Jesus, come back to the cross, and come back to the Word. When we do, we will not be in error. We'll be on the straight narrow, and very well 
lit path of the just that is a shining light that shines more and more to the perfect day. Please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for the word of God that so faithfully attests to Jesus Christ, the living word, the Savior, the Lord, and the soon coming King. Stimulate our hunger for the word more than ever. Stimulate our thirst for the rivers of water of the Spirit more than ever. And God, use this message and like messages to cure the epidemic of biblical illiteracy so that we can be salt and light, make a difference to our society, our generation, and to our world. Thank you for sending revival. We pray this in faith, and we believe you will do it. In Christ's mighty name, amen. Thank you for joining with us here at Global Pulpit. Please like, share, and subscribe to this service, and we will continue our mini-series on Walk Through the Word, How to Study God's Word, that will be transformational to your life.